Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here at last with Hans Rosebaud's Sibelius recordings. Here they are, actually. It's a lovely, flattering picture as usual. It looks like a head stuck on top of a large... I, I don't know. Anyway, let's not go there. Uh, we get... What do we get? We get Symphonies 2, 4, and 5 on two CDs, plus three liter, excellently sung by Kim Borg, a three orchestral leader. That actually, a couple of them are orchestrated by Sibelius, but these are not the Sibelius orchestrations, not that it makes any difference. The three leader are uh, Come Away Death, and then uh, Diamonds in the March Snow, and finally Two Evening. And they're lovely, lovely songs. And, you know, if you know Sibelius' songs, you know he wrote some really, really nice ones. Some beautiful, beautiful pieces. And, like I said, they're sung by Kim Borg, the baritone, extremely nicely. So that's a wonderful opening. But, of course, we want to talk about the symphonies. And, you know, Rosebud Sibelius' record, frankly, is mixed. There was that terrific Deutsche Grammophone Originals disc that featured Tapiola and the Karelia Suite, and some other stuff, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's something else on there, too. It was all very good. Then there is his recording of the Sixth Symphony with the WDR Radio Orchestra of Cologne, and that was issued on ICA or something, one of those labels. I reviewed it. You can go see the review in classicstoday.com. It sucks. Holy cow, it is horrible. It is the most horrible recording of the sixth I have ever heard in my life, and I've heard some bad ones. It is perverse, and it is horribly played, and it is, of course, dismally recorded because if it's an old radio broadcast. It's just awful, 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 awful. So what is one to do? with a conductor one really, really respects, like Rosebud, because everybody loved him, and he really was a fabulous conductor, there's no question about it, but everyone has their off days. There are no off days here. I am very happy to tell you, but they are very, very interesting. You know, whether you, you that aside from that sixth, aside from that sixth, what are the fascinating things about a really great conductor, and Rosebud was one of those, make no mistake, is that even though they may do something that's a little bit strange, they convince you. They convince you of its rightness. And these performances do that. Well, at least a couple of them do. They're not necessary in the Fourth Symphony. But the Second Symphony is possibly the most, the most interesting of all of the performances here. And the reason is because it has a rather slow opening movement. Um, and takes about a bit more than 11 minutes, which is really on the slow side. Usually 9 to 10 is sort of where you ought to be. And it has a very, very quick finale. Really quick. It's great. <laughs> I personally feel that you cannot play that finale quickly enough. That also takes about 11 minutes, about the same as the first movement. So you get this nice balance between the two. I mean, Carrion takes like 14 or 15 minutes or something like that. It's just, it's, it's, it's abominably slow. Somewhere in the middle is, is, is what's normal. But the point is that even though the opening, and this is the really controversial part, begins so slowly, you know, and you think, oh God, it's never going to get there. Never going to get there. But it does. Because his handling of tempo is very flexible, not like crazy, not like, you know, obviously shifting gears, but very natural. When the music wants to move forward, he does. <laughs> when it doesn't have to, he doesn't. It's, you know, it's hard to believe that something that you might think is so obvious is the hallmark of great conducting, but it really is, because you can't count on people to do anything, anything that the music wants to do. You sometimes wonder why they bother conducting it at all, but he knows where the music is going, and he lets it go there. 
And that's the point. So the first movement is wonderfully shaped. It really is. The, the second movement is, is pretty normal. And the scherzo is, is delightfully zippy, which it's supposed to be. And like I said, the finale is amazingly swift. So it's a very unconventional version of the second, but one that's well worth hearing. And it's also worth pointing out that at the time that these recordings were made, which was in the 50s, you know, Sibelius was still alive until 1957. And, and the tradition of Sibelius' performance had not become standardized throughout the world, as it more or less is today. So, so Rosebud's approach was, was at a time when the, the, the Sibelius style was still forming. And he was never very popular in Germany. I mean, even though Carion played him and a couple other people, I mean, Sibelius, ne Sibelius's reputation in Germany has always been um, a, 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 an iffy sometime thing, shall we say. And so Rosebud's versions of this music are, are quite, quite individual. And I found the seventh to be, I mean, second, number two, to be rather captivating. I don't think I would listen to it every day, but it's certainly a valid interpretation. And the point is, it's beautifully done. It's done to convince you. So now we move on to the symphony number five. Now the fifth symphony um, also receives a, a very good performance, but here we see some of the problems with the orchestra. You know, it's the SWR, um, a Sudwestfunk Orchestra Baden-Baden at that point. Now, it, they are not as horrible as the Cologne Orchestra because this was Rosebud's orchestra and he trained them. And, and these were also not live recordings. These are studio recordings made for radio broadcast. So that means that, you know, they had the opportunity to get everything right. The playing as such is quite accurate. The orchestra itself is clearly, clearly second rate. I mean, you know, the woodwinds are kind of, kind of grainy sounding and, and, and the brass don't have a lot of fullness. I mean, they're not making mistakes, but they also don't sound very imposing or very powerful. The timpani are horrible. They're just sort of, well, when you can hear them, they're, they're, they're very sort of flabby and they don't have any impact. Um, and that's a problem in Sibelius. It really is. So in this performance of the fifth, it, it has wonderful flow and a real organic sense of movement because Rosebud did that stuff really, really well. But it doesn't have any of the heroic qualities the music has. You know, the transition between the two halves of the first movement, it, it just doesn't have much climactic feel to it. It's beautifully managed in terms of the tempo shifts but you just want it to have more impact. The end of the first movement, the, the most of the finale, particularly the ending of the finale, it's really rather fascinating because Rosebud really speeds up at the end and he makes those separated chords not be so separated <laughs> because he's moving so quickly. And again, it's a very unconventional view of the piece and some will not like it, but I think he carries it off. I think he carries it off convincingly and I'm willing to go along with him because he, what he does, he does so well and does it with such conviction and such, such seeming inevitability. And that's just marvelous. And then we have symphony number four. It's just a great performance. It's absolutely a terrific performance. You know, Rosebud was famous for doing, doing very, very, you know, way out modern avant-garde music. But I think at heart, he was kind of a romantic because at the end of the fourth symphony, you know, the end of the Fourth Symphony is one of the most nihilistic pieces of music in the entire repertoire. It's just a series of mezzo forte chords in tempo, which I think is what Sibelius writes there. So it's just ja da da da, boom 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 boom. It's over. It's totally icy cold and dismissive. Rosebud can't bring himself to do it. He, he, he makes a very gentle landing with much lower dynamics. It's practically pianissimo. I mean, it's, it's soft and it's, it's, it's caressing and he's, he's trying to be, it's very somber, don't get me wrong, but, but it's not that sort of brusque, screw you ending that Sibelius wrote. Not a bit, not a bit, but boy, is this a beautiful performance. It is so acutely felt in its, in its balancing of texture. The first movement is amazing. Just listen to the opening paragraph. 
in the first movement where you hear the strings build up layer by layer by layer by layer and you can hear it all there there's there are there are details in this performance that you won't hear in any other and it's all at tempo because it's not a slow performance not at all he's he's allowing you to hear all this stuff as the music's moving along he never ever 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 stops or kills the music's natural momentum and that's another mark of his 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 genius as a conductor the other thing he does throughout these performances that i think makes them so noteworthy is that he really shows you what the value of the value is in having clean attacks clean unisons really tight good ensemble I mean, you know, we always hear all this BS about, well, Fort Wengler wanted it to be more somehow organic and, and, and you know, to emerge somehow like, a, like a, an amoeba splitting itself into bits by never having a precise anything. Let me tell you something. Precision matters, and it matters in this music, especially when it's allied to such a keen sense of rhythm. And, you know, there you'll, you'll find time and time again that... that Rosebud asks his players to mark their entrances with a subtle, not an overwhelming, but just a subtle accent. So you hear each voice in the texture coming in, and that allows you to follow it without exaggeration. It's done so, so deftly. That's the word, deft. It's done deftly. It's wonderful. And there's just time and again you hear that in these performances. And they, they lead you into some you know, inner voices and you know, layers in the texture that you never would be paying attention to. And it's just with a subtle little... It's all he has to do. It's great stuff. So, obviously, these are mono recordings. They are sonically pretty good. The orchestra is average at best, but accurate. They're not making any gross errors. And the interpretations are incredibly distinctive and very, very powerfully put across. I mean, that's the bottom line. So if you are collecting the Hans Rosebott edition um, on, on SWR Classic, and of course you should be, then uh, this is a, a marvelous, marvelous um, addition to it. It really is. And if you love Sibelius, you're going to want to hear these because they are absolutely different enough to, to justify your getting, you know, yet another zillionth interpretation. And now all they have to do is reattach his head to the rest of his body and we're in business. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks for joining me. Take care.